behavioral health managed care entities, as well as their county and state mental health partners. Um, and that includes uh, agencies, providers, and folks who receive services. And we'll also get a view from the field. We'll have one behavioral health managed care entity's response to the toolkit that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. So today's presenters, I'll tell you a little bit about them. We have uh, Rick Barron from the Temple Collaborative, and he's a researcher and trainer in the mental health field. He's been in the field for a long time. He has been uh, part of the Temple Collaborative uh, since the beginning. He's currently the Director of Knowledge Translation for the Collaborative on Community Inclusion. And he, um, he'll tell you more about the collaborative as he explains the domains of community inclusion and what, it, and what they are and a little bit more about the work that the collaborative does. But previously, before Rick joined the collaborative, he was the director of the Pew Charitable Trust grant-making program for health and human service agencies that served adults in the five-county Philadelphia region. And prior to that, for 25 years, Rick was the executive director of Matrix Research Institute in Philadelphia, where he was the principal investigator and project director on um, two dozen federally funded research and training programs. And they focus on employment for people with mental health conditions. Rick is really one of the field's great experts on employment. Um, Rick was also the recipient of two of the NIDIRR Switzer Independent Research Fellowships. And both of those focused on strategies to expand competitive employment opportunities for people with mental health conditions. We're also very fortunate, and I, and I thank very much Leslie Schwalbe, uh, who is the Vice President of State and Local Government Programs with Optum Health for joining us today. And I'll tell you a little bit about Optum. Optum is committed to helping make the health system work better for everyone. And in collaboration with their partners, Optum focuses on three drivers of transformative change. One is modernizing the health system infrastructure. Second is advancing care. And three is empowering consumers. And it's through these strategies that Optum will achieve a healthier future and one that delivers improved health care outcomes and better health care experiences. And we're very lucky to have Leslie with us. She is um, also brings a wealth of experience. Leslie is the health care executive uh, with, uh, as I said, many years of experience working in and with state and local governments health plans, and community providers. Leslie is the past deputy director of the Arizona Department of Health Services, and there she was responsible for developing treatment and support services for people enrolled in Medicaid and in non-Medicaid behavioral health services. And today, is Leslie's the senior vice president with Optum, part of the United Health Group. So thank you to Rick and to Leslie. And I'm Debbie Plotnick. I'm Vice President of Mental Health and Systems Advocacy at Mental Health America. And Mental Health America is the nation's oldest advocacy organization. We just celebrated our 107th birthday. We used to be known as the National Mental Health Association. We have affiliates in 41 states, well over 200 affiliates. And um, many of them are still known as Mental Health Association. And uh, many more are known as Mental Health America, but we're with a big umbrella family, and we um, do advocacy, education, and have, uh, through our affiliates, many of them are also service providers. And my role at Mental Health America is to uh, coordinate and look at federal policies, state policies, and to conduct grassroots advocacy on the ground. Uh, pre prior to coming to Mental Health America uh, at the national organization, I uh, was director of advocacy at the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and there I conducted grassroots advocacy, um, much of the policy work, the same kinds of things I do today, as well as design uh, programs for folks. Um, with mental health conditions in the Fox County area in the Philadelphia region. And it's been my um, pleasure and priv privilege to work with the folks at the Temple Collaborative for some years now. So that's who you'll hear from today. And I just wanted to talk a little bit before Rick gets into uh, 
a lot of detail around the Temple Collaborative, the domains of inclusion, to be clear on what we mean by inclusion, because there's a lot of confusion out there. And I love this graphic. Um, and thank you to Dory Hutchinson of, um, of Boston University for the idea behind the um, this graphic. It's had a little bit of modification. Um, but I think it very clearly, when one looks at the bottom left circle, what exclusion is with folks on the outside, and then when folks are all together in one place and still on the outside, how we have segregation, that we can even have integration, but people are still together in a way where they're not interacting with others. And at the top, of course, you can see how that's different when we have inclusion. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rick. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, oh, Lord, I can hear myself. Just trying to get the, the right slide up. Uh, there we go. Jared, I'm having a little, ah, there we go. Thank you very much, Debbie. Sorry for the delay. Uh, and uh, thanks, thank you, Debbie, for pulling this together. Um, for Leslie, for joining us. Thanks for all of you um, out there who have joined us. Thanks as well to the National Institute on Disability and Independent Living Research and Rehabilitation. Uh, this, uh, our research, our grant is a research and training center um, from NIDILLRR. Uh, we do a, an extraordinary amount of research and a great deal of training and technical assistance, all focused around the issue of community inclusion uh, for people with mental health conditions. Um, this is our uh, 13th year um, and uh, wanted to remind you that there is a wealth of information on our website at tucollaborative.org uh, for all kinds of information um, that talks about how do we help people with, with mental health conditions uh, participate more fully in their communities. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about community inclusion uh, and, and then lead us back to Debbie and the particular project she's been working on um, as one of our partners in the operation of the Research and Training Center. One of our other partners is here in Philadelphia. It is the National Mental Health Consumer Self-Help Clearinghouse um, at the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania, where Debbie also worked for a number of years. Um, and, and the three of us have been working together um, around a number of issues for a number of years. But let me begin with uh, the definition of community inclusion that comes from the director of the Research and Training Center, Dr. Mark Solzer, who talks about community inclusion being the opportunity for people with mental health conditions to live in the community uh, with the chance to be valued like everyone else. Our emphasis here is on participation, um, for people to be able to uh, lead the kinds of lives that, that they choose to lead um, by participating in a, in a wide array of, of uh, everyday activities in, in community settings, uh, so they have an opportunity to, to live where they choose, um, to work in competitive employment, uh, to attend uh, churches or social events or civic activities in their community, um, and not only to, to be able to do that, um, but for the policies and programs and practices that are needed to support them in participating in community life to be readily available. That really is the challenge and what we think of as uh, the, the challenge that, that will frame the next generation of community mental health policies, programs, and practices. Um, how do we help people, uh, we, we not just uh, say people ought to be participating, but provide the facilitation and the supports people need, as well as the encouragement uh, to participate most actively in, in all aspects of community life. Um, it suggests in some ways um, a, a greater balance between uh, many of the activities that are part of the uh, community mental health world uh, supported by behavioral managed care companies um, from uh, the, the emphasis on in-house programming and toward um, a, a series of, of, of programs and practices uh, that more actively engage people 
in community participation. Um, and it also means, uh, we think, uh, greater work on all of our parts uh, to work with communities to help them to more actively seek out um, and, and facilitate the participation of people with disabilities and people with, uh, with mental health conditions um, in, in particular. Uh, we've begun talking about welcoming communities uh, in the mental health field only recently. Uh, other disability fields have been looking at um, how do they work with uh, community the individuals and organizations uh, across that whole array of domains uh, to help people so that they are welcoming people um, with enthusiasm into their activities. Um, and now I need to go to the next slide, but let's do that. So part of what this means um, is, is um, some of it is around the, the fundamental principles of recovery with which I imagine most of you are familiar. Um, respect for the individual, empowerment and self-direction, uh, a sense of hope rather than chronicity in the lives. Uh, Leslie and Debbie and I were talking the other day about how this, in, in some sense, um, not, not only reflects recovery, but how community inclusion is in some ways what recovery is for. That is, that, that empowerment and, and help and respect ought to be um, in service of some individual goals that people have for themselves. And we think those goals are primarily uh, goals of, of community inclusion, of participation. Um, it means that in, in looking at our programs and our services and our policies, that we want a stronger supported pathway uh, uh, so that in-house activities, if we provide them, lead as quickly as possible to participation in the mainstream. There's a group in England, uh, the Center for Community Inclusion, that talks about um, how in-house activities and activities that are solely for people uh, with disabilities uh, tend to, to reinforce notions of segregation unless they are part of a supported pathway to participating in the community uh, the way everyone else does. Um, and again, uh, it means that our organizations are going to have to engage in ways that we haven't before with individuals and organizations in the community outside of the human services, outside of, of, of the mental health system um, and start to work with them about how they create a welcoming environment um, in, in, in a whole array of dimensions. Um, how, do we, how do we help churches? How do we help realtors? How do we help employers? How do we help uh, YMCAs? Um, how do we help um, hobby groups? Um, uh, how do we help the community say, these are people we actively want to solicit participation from, uh, and here's what we can do to welcome them. Um, as I say, there are a lot of uh, resources on our website um, that uh, you can turn to. We're at tucollaborative.org to talk about all of this. Um, but as, as Debbie and, and I began to talk about uh, the work we wanted to do together, um, we talked about the importance of, of two things. Uh, Debbie really came to us with the notion uh, that uh, there was a large role for behavioral managed care entities to play, both um, in, in uh, the, the, the way in which they structure their contracts with state and county uh, mental health administrations and in the way uh, they work with the agencies with whom they contract um, in the community. How do we get behavioral managed care companies, uh, Debbie asked, um, to focus on this issue um, and, and, and play a larger role in promoting community inclusion. And then um, as we're doing that, how do we focus on the kinds of evaluation of how successful those efforts can be? Um, and we've led to two publications. Uh, both of them are available at this website that you see there. Um, it's also in the chat uh, notion that Jared put there. Um, and Debbie's gonna take you through both publications um, but we, we wanted to make sure um, you know both about our general website and about these two wonderful documents that Debbie has created. And with that, um, Debbie, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Rick. Um, let me share my desktop and get back to uh, 
to the slideshow, so bear with me for one moment while I start the slideshow. Um, we're set up, and I just need to start again, not from the beginning, from current slide. There we go. Um, so thank you, Rick, and thank you for that introduction. As Rick mentioned, we created uh, several products. One is the toolkit that you see on the screen right now. And this is particularly directed to behavioral health managed care entities because we think they're a very important partner in promoting community inclusion. They're not the only partner, but they certainly are very, very important. And um, the reason that I came to the Temple Collaborative with the concept of reaching out to the managed care entities is that they have a long history of working uh, very successfully to promote recovery in uh, with county and state behavioral health departments. They've really been pioneers. They've created some of the programs and created a lot of the evidence base in showing that recovery-focused services make a difference in people's lives so that they are something that reflect recovery values and something that is good value for folks receiving services, folks paying for services, and getting people back into life, which of course reflects the value of recovery. Um, behavioral health managed care entities have really provided tremendous leadership over a long period now and creating, as I mentioned, the evidence base, especially in peer services. So they've been great partners in um, being able to uh, keep the uh, data, if you will, and that really helps shore up the evidence base. But one of the things that really um, struck me as the most important reason to partner with behavioral health managed care was their long history of bringing people with lived experience into leadership positions. Uh, people who, who were very high executives in the companies. The companies asking individuals who've been there and done that, who understand what it's like and understand what it is that people want and need. So that's why we reached out especially to the managed care entities, but they're not the only partners. Other important partners, of course, are the people that we all work together. It, it, it is very much a, a partnership where we all intersect. Mental health provider agencies, folks themselves, who receive services, it's very important that we think about what are the things that they need to be thinking about. So that there needs to be cultural shifts that happen with the providers, with the payers, with the, with the recipients of services to use community resources. And the resources themselves, as Rick was saying, need to undergo culture shifts. And the culture shift begins with, as Rick said, thinking about not just using site-based services, supports that are just for folks with mental health conditions, but people entering into the community and using the kinds of training supports that anyone else would use. And if they need some assistance, supporting them in using those community resources. And that service recipients themselves really need to come to expect to use the resources, and the resources need to be welcoming, as Rick mentioned. So from our toolkit, and I just pulled a couple of the action items, and I'll go through them very briefly, um, so you can get an idea, and there's much more detail in the toolkit, so I do encourage you downloading it. Um, I, I th one of the things that we thought was a really easy one, um, although maybe not, and we'll hear from Leslie in a few minutes, is for entities, all of the above, but certainly behavioral health managed care entities and the organizations with which they contract to add the principles of community inclusion to their own vision statements. And this would include explicitly recognizing the value of community inclusion and what it means for and to people with behavioral health needs. So that that was a step that is an item that might be the first one to take or not. Um, but we certainly think that an action item that would be beneficial for all would be training and engaging with folks. And this would be for staff. Um, for staff of state and local mental health authorities, as well as for uh, behavioral health managed care entity staff and providers within their networks and providers with whom they contract with. There's some wonderful resources, again, on the Temple Collaborative website 
Um, they've designed some online training programs, and each program is designed specifically for the groups that I just mentioned. Um, so if you work for an agency, it would be for you. If, you. if you're a county or a state, it would be for you. And they've designed this with the College of Recovery and Community Inclusion. And you can get to all of those links, of course, from the Temple Collaborative website. There's also fabulous information for folks who use the services. Um, there's wonderful guides for people with uh, mental health conditions, um, two of which I have I've mentioned here, but there are others. The practical guide for people with mental health conditions who want to work, and research shows that that's just about everybody, but that doesn't mean that everybody is. Um, the other one is a practical guide for people with disabilities who want to go to college. So um, as I said, there's even more great resources on the website. Another action item, and this one's a little bit more difficult and it will take a little bit more working along the way, and I hope Leslie will talk a little more about this, is contracting with community providers. And this um, holds true for behavioral health managed care entities and for state and local uh, counties, if you will, uh, payers who contract. Um, with agencies or going back and forth with the managed care entities, that in the contract, it's clearly outlined the importance of community inclusion and the expectation that community inclusion practices will be part of service delivery. And as I said, there's far more in the toolkit uh, getting into specifics. Um, but we think it's very, very important to prioritize the use of programs and practices and tools that empower and activate consumers. So supports for sure, but supports that put the person at the center and help them become even more engaged in their recovery journeys. And some of these that Rick already mentioned, of course, are shared decision making and self-direction are really the keys to what is described, and you'll read this a little bit more in the toolkit, is personalized and personal medicine. And um, people who want to know the difference between personalized and personal, check out the uh, toolkit and go into a little section about that. Another area, another action item, is to modify the job descriptions for folks who work for the contracting agencies and who provide services that really prioritize community inclusion. Some of the ways to begin would be to review the staff roles and to review how staff roles are or are not delineated and to see how community inclusion is delineated in provider contracts. But not only do you need to do this, there needs to be support there needs to be administrative and managerial support for engaging in um, community inclusion activities. And this has to do with being sensitive to managing, uh, for example, peers with things that are appropriate to peers and to their jobs that they do. Um, this kind of job description that's a little bit different needs to be coordinated with the providers. There's also an important role for clin clinicians to take into account the community inclusion goals of the folks they're working with, to solicit them, to find out, to ask them what they are, and as they go through a clinical relationship, to come back again and say, how are you meeting your community inclusion goals? And I'll talk more about that when I get to the measure in a few minutes. Um, case managers really play an important role here in assisting to coordinate treatment, supports, and services, but not just any ones, not the ones that are regularly offered, but the ones that meet individuals' community inclusion goals. So as job descriptions are modified, it's very important to again come back to what is it that the individual who's receiving services wants and needs. And of course, peer specialists play an incredibly important role here as to rehabilitation practices and other staff in supporting people to plan their goals, to determine which supports are necessary and which ones they'd like, and then providing support as they go along the way. And as I said, I'll get more into measuring in a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to give a little taste of one of the examples that we have in the toolkit. And this is a job description, again, uh, for your action item of creating job descriptions. This is a job description from the Pioneer Center in Illinois. And they have a staff position that is community uh, inclusion specialist. They also have a supervisor 
who supervises with the role of making sure that community inclusion is a priority. So you can see more things like these job descriptions in the toolkit. Um, so I won't go into much detail there. But this is one that I think is essential for um, really making a difference. And uh, after Leslie gives us some feedback, I'll come back to why it's so important to measure the quality of community inclusion services. And of course, there are ways to incentivize doing the measures for community inclusion, and I'll get to what some of the details are on that in a minute. But some of the ways to further it is to incentivize um, perhaps additional reimbursement for using community inclusion by providing um, additional reimbursement, again, based on progress. So these are incentives that behavioral health managed care entities and their county and state partners um, and even agencies can take in rewarding uh, an increase in community inclusion because as Rick says, community inclusion is what recovery is for and it's a great way to see how people are progressing in their recovery. Um, another issue is to uh, measure uh, which providers are doing a great job. Um, that, again, is another incentivizing uh, role. And, of course, um, providing uh, additional reimbursement to programs uh, that have progress for folks who are meeting and uh, who are uh, coming up with community inclusion goals and who are progressing in their community inclusion goals. So what are we talking about community inclusion goals? Um, and in our website, and I'm afraid it didn't translate well into slides, so please do go and look at the toolkit because you'll see the entire measure there, and it's really quite a wonderful tool. It's an easy-to-use tool. It's a 26-item measure, and it asks questions that peer specialists, case managers, clinicians, and individuals themselves can work on individually or together in measuring how folks are increasing their community inclusion. And it does that by asking how many days in the past 30 days did the person themselves engage in activities and specific activities, the degree of importance of the activities to the person, and whether or not they engaged in those activities with or without support. Some of these activities are, well, in fact, all of these activities are things that we all do and things that everyone uh, does at some time, and they really uh, give a good connotation of how people are engaging with the rest of the community. Some of the 26 items include going to the library, going grocery shopping, going to a restaurant or a coffee shop, either by yourself or with others, going to a place of worship or engaging in a recreational activity. And of course, recreational activities can include going to uh, playing sports, going to a sporting event, going to a park, um, engaging in a nature walk, or taking a walk by yourself. And of course, one that, that Rick is really expert in is working for pay, employment. How many days in the past month did people work for pay? Or work towards a degree that will help further their uh, vocational goals, or take a degree, again, that will help their educational goals or vocational goals, or how many days did they take a class, a class in the community. Perhaps it's a um, yoga class or a photography class or any other class in the community. How many days did the person volunteer I mean, uh, to assist others in need in the community um, in formal or informal volunteering programs? How many days in the month did people get together with friends or with their family? Or how many days did they entertain those friends or family? So there's both passive and active getting together, whether it's visiting and participating or entertaining um, themselves. And another important way to measure community inclusion is how many days did folks engage in a civic or political activity, certainly important in this election year. So um, I'm going to turn things over to Leslie now, and she's going to give a response from Managed Care about uh, 
from the uh, industry about what some of the things in the toolkit are. So I'm going to turn this over to Leslie. Hi, good, good morning for those of you out in the West. And uh, thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Rick, to the Temple University Collaborative and Mental Health America. This is really a, a great opportunity for us to collaborate on just begin the discussion of really moving community inclusion for people with psychiatric disabilities. Um, this discussion of really how um, to do it, given this wonderful tool, toolkit, quite frankly. Um, the, the toolkit is, um, is for us, I think, a, another great example of collaboration for and among those um, between research, advocacy, and implementation in terms of how do we actually move forward? Um, how to, you know, as, as Rick said earlier, um, how do we really help people um, uh, get to where, to where recovery is and wh what recovery is for? Um, and that's in service for people who need their, um, who want to um, have community inclusion goals. So, you know, in, in talking about this, this was really kind of an exciting opportunity for us because we got to, you know, kind of say, what do we like about the toolkit? Maybe what we don't like about the toolkit, what could be easily implemented, what could be harder? And, um, you know, I don't think there's anything that could be said that we don't like the toolkit uh, because it's just packed full of information. It is um, extremely um, uh, nifty and handy in terms of all the, quite frankly, the hyperlinks. So when we are using this, when we use this internally in a large managed care company, we can have all that information at our, our fingertips, quite frankly. So it helps us, you know, what's really, it's really incredible about it is that there's clear domains to help us focus. And those domains, um, when you think about where healthcare is right now, and you think about the larger issue of, a, of overall a person's healthcare wellness and um, ability to achieve uh, personal medicine and personal goals, it really aligns nicely also with the social determinants of health focus that we see also on the, you know, the the healthcare side or the whole integration of, of physical and behavioral health um, services, and so. It's really kind of a specialization to some extent of, of those social determinants um, for people with certain mental health conditions. Conditions, excuse me. The, um, the action items and steps are quite excellent. Uh, just from our perspective, again, they're, they're clear, they're concise, there's great examples in there. Um, you actually pointed out a couple, Debbie, of the things that uh, we like as well in particular is, uh, I'll start out actually with action item number seven, the RF. RFP input. It is true that often states do look to managed care organizations and behavioral health managed care organizations to solicit input into what kind, what what should we be looking for with for people it, um, with um, mental health conditions. And so the information that you put together um, in action item number seven is great. The language is great, and we will we'll plan on using that with our sister health plan, United Healthcare. Um, the number number four, the job descriptions. Again, a great example of how we can um, change our own job descriptions internally, internally whether there's a, our field care advocacy, um, whether it's our peer support specialist, whether it's case managers, we're um, really kind of happy to see this language come about. Uh, what do we think can be easily implemented? I think changing those job descriptions um, for field care advocates and possibly peer support specialists and potentially adding community inclusion specialists as a uh, as a position is also possible. Um, the training we believe can be done um, given all the information that's out there that's available is really is really going to be quite key. Um, and then you know working with providers I think is going to be the real key to making this successful. Depending on what the requirements are of a state or a local community, you know we really have to work together with pr providers to design what the inclusion service system looks like, what the, you know, what the actual um, focuses might be for certain populations, whether it's housing and employment or with other, the others that are more um, advanced in their recovery, it could be other issues as well. So it's, it's really, I think it's gonna be key that we work with providers to determine the best way that they can help people with their community inclusion goals. Um, some things that might, might be harder to implement, I think the, the one question I have is on the, on the measurement tool is just how often and how frequent should we be doing this type of tool. Um, I think if we believe that it's going to be a good indication of, um, of people doing better in their, in their care, then we should do it more often, but that might lead to the tool being maybe a little bit too long. So I just kind of have that question about, you know, the implementation of the, of the measurement tool. But I think that's a, it's a good, you know, kind of follow-up question, kind of follow-up thought and idea that we could do afterwards. 
Um, what else can we do to develop and disseminate the toolkit? I think we have to continue. Um, we can internally in Optum, um, uh, we can get this to our peer workers, our care advocates, our providers, and um, anyone we're working with to our sister company, United Healthcare, and we will do that. Um, we will be happy to create, um, uh, you know, do um, additional work with the Temple Collaborative and the MHA about making additional presentations. But I think that's a, a lot of way people learn about um, what what is now um, evidence out there and how we can actually do something based upon a very um, comprehensive toolkit. I think also we should, um, you know, consider what, you know, Fully, more fully developing the community inclusion specialist role that you identified in here. I think you're onto something there. You know, I, I see a lot of similarity on, on with case management type of work, but this really puts a different um, and more focused um, um, more focus on uh, the community inclusion aspect. Um, how can this be? The other thing I think I have a question about is how can this be used with persons with substance use disorders as well, and how do we? Um, fit that uh, fit this toolkit to them, um, but the, overall we are you know just extremely excited um, to see the next steps and then are with you in, in terms of helping you develop this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, um, and thank you. We're, we're, we really appreciate Optum's feedback on this. Um, you know, coming from a large managed care entity, it means a great deal to us and as we move forward. And thank you for mentioning that the toolkit and the monograph I'll talk about in a few minutes are designed as web documents so that they have hyperlinks throughout that um, provide more information and resources. And some of the action items that I didn't make slides about, Leslie mentioned, as being her favorite. So I, um, for all our, our listeners to, on today's webinar, please do take a look at, we provide really extensive checklists and some sample language to put in request uh, for proposals, um, what state and local entities, some of the things they can ask for in their proposals, as well as how those responding to those requests um, can put uh, community inclusion as uh, the goal and make sure that it is promoted throughout. We also give a um, example of under our action items for policy implementation, we give a, a, a very in-depth example of New York State as it redesigned its Medicaid program and it redesigned its Medicaid program to promote things that are community inclusion and recovery goals. Um, and that those lists, again, can be found in the toolkit as well as uh, hyperlinks to uh, where you can see some of the things that they requested, some of the things that were in there, and uh, how to find information on um, all of the things I spoke about earlier, shared decision making, um, and how to uh, link to evidence-based practices and so on and so forth. So we've designed this document as a living, breathing document and uh, Leslie's feedback on how we can make it better and how we can work to disseminate it and who else we might bring into the process is greatly appreciated because we hope this will be, as I said, a living, breathing. Uh, document, not something um, that is static. So again, thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit more about the uh, community inclusion measure. And um, I created a little monograph after I was at a policy meeting. And, and the outcome of this policy meeting was, was rather um, remarkable in that this particular meeting created a turnabout in a policy perspective, and it's a relatively short and easy read, and again, it's downloadable uh, from the Temple Collaborative website, which is linked here. Um, and it, it's, it's just telling a little story, so as I said, it's an easy read. Um, it features some of the most amazing and accomplished experts in, in the behavioral health field, like um, Dr. Ron Manderscheid, and, and of course, our own Temple Collaborative, Rick Barron, um, was at this meeting and some folks from high up in uh, health and human services and people who look at quality measures as well as a uh, number of the large national advocacy organizations, Mental Health America, our colleagues at NAMI, our colleagues 
at the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance and our colleagues at the National Council. And um, in this monograph, I just tell this short story about how when folks who were diving very deeply into the weeds, and if you're a geek, there's a little bit of geekiness about quality measures, how they came to be, um, how, uh, and again, it's hyperlinked, so you can uh, learn about the National uh, Quality Forum, if you like, and really, you know, look at that very closely, or not, and just read the story of seeing once people began to think about measuring community inclusion instead of the usual measures that people think about when they think about quality. They tend to think about clinical measures. Clinical measures are extraordinarily important. Clinical measures to the individual, such as, you know, how long are folks staying out of the hospital? Are folks, uh, you know, engaging in treatments and things like that? Are they having, uh, you know, are, they, are there scales that we measure clinical outcomes getting better and better? They're certainly important. But when you start to measure for our people getting back into life and you can see that they're going out with their friends more often, that they're looking for work, that they're back in school, then you can really measure recovery. So um, just a little plug to uh, download and, and read the monograph. And then we wanted to uh, leave time. And I know I'm hoping Jared uh, has some questions and comments from the folks who are listening today, because what we would like to do is provide whatever technical assistance we have and to solicit your responses and your feedback. So, um, Jared, you have uh, questions and comments for us? So, we actually haven't had anyone ask any questions during the webinar. So, I guess at this point, if any of the attendees want to... Um to ask uh, questions of the pa uh, panelists, they can go ahead and type it into the chat, and I'll relay them to the panelists. Debbie, let me pick up while we're we're uh, hoping for some response um, on on the last topic of, of quality measures, and particularly the Temple University community participation measure. One of the things we're finding among the agencies that are using the measure is that it can serve uh, multiple purposes. Uh, for an agency just getting started looking at community participation issues, um, uh, implementing the, the, the measure uh, with all or a, a sample of the people being served uh, provides an agency of a kind of baseline measure of how well are they doing, um, how much participation is there in community life, and not only how much participation is there, but how much more and in what areas does the, the service recipient population say um, it wants to be involved? So you, as an agency, you can have an opportunity to kind of figure out where people are, where the emphasis is, where you might want to start. If everyone says, uh, I'm doing fine, but I'd really rather have a job, um, then it provides you a, a kind of focus for some of the community inclusion initiatives. Um, as, a, as an agency, and then it also allows you um, to measure individual progress as you move forward. Leslie, you were going to make a point? Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect because, it, it was, you know, I'm glad to hear that you're collecting those comments and the understanding of what provider agencies might be doing at this time, and I hope we can have, you know, there's access to that kind of, you know, anecdotal as well as, you know, evaluation type um, work. But then secondly, I'm wondering, is it, is it necessary and is it possible or probable that we sometimes may need a kind of a readiness checklist for ourselves from a, you know, behavioral health managed care company or from providers, you know, to make sure that we're ready to, you know, not only to work with people to help develop the community participation goals, but also able to um, sort of also, the sound there. also help people. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how, how much you heard of it, but. What I was trying to suggest was a way to um, to how do we measure our own readiness uh, to be you know participate in the community inclusion um, you know goal setting process with members that we may see with people that we see. So, so it's a good question. I think part of the answer may be um, to use the toolkit um, as your own, uh, and, and we should probably be doing that as well, uh, developing in the instrument. But if you look at the, the 10 or so suggestions that are made in the toolkit, um, you could sit down and say, uh, well, do we have a community inclusion 
um, as one of the missions of our agencies? Do, do, have we done our own sort of policy scan uh, to see what kinds of, of um, policies we may have or practices we may have that either support or, or serve as a barrier to community inclusion? Is our staff trained in this direction? Are we saying to peer specialists, um, we want to expand your role uh, to include your working with people um, around their community inclusion goals? Do we want to say that to our, our case management personnel as well? Um, are we using the, the most current uh, support technologies that move people more rapidly into housing and, and jobs um, and, and social life in the community? Um, so, okay, so, so we have a few uh, questions no. from the chat. I don't know if you guys wanted to, to jump in and try yeah, answering sure. those. Okay. Yeah. Sure, John. So the first question we have is from uh, Ellen. Uh, she asks, is there a reason why you use the term case manager and not care manager? That term has less of a medical field. Uh, is this a payment issue? Um, I'm, this is Debbie. I use that, and I used it only because that is often what you see in job descriptions that currently exist and in services that are often provided. Um, and certainly it is not with the intention to be medical model or not. It is merely the term of art. So um, all suggestions are welcome on ways to be better. And I like care manager. So thanks for bringing it up, Ellen. We have another question from Judith. How uh, may we access your expertise in our community? Will you come to a retreat where we develop our value statement? You betcha. <laughs> I think one of the things uh, that we're charged with doing as uh, a research and training center, and, and that includes uh, certainly those of us here at Temple as, as well as Mental Health America, um, as well as the folks, our other partners at the Clearinghouse, is not only to, to do the research and develop materials, uh, but to get out into the field and help people translate the research um, and, and development activities into programs in the field. And, and yes, we would very much like to uh, welcome the opportunities to uh, talk further. Uh, we can do a consultation over the phone. Uh, we're happy to come out to agencies and work with them. Um, and if, if the retreat is uh, in a particularly attractive place, count me in. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a question from Patty. As both a provider and a parent, I'm hoping we include consumers' own sense of their quality of life as increased inclusion. It is, it is so important, but done poorly, it can create the opposite of what we believe is possible. I think that's more of a statement. Gabby, uh, sure. I think that, that the intention here is to always put the person first. So it, it, it isn't necessarily what it is that other people think is important. That's why all throughout the toolkit, um, at each step, the action items say engage with the person to find what their goals are, to look at what is important to them. And when you download the toolkit and you see the measure, you'll see that it asks the person themselves who's looking at the 26 items how important each item is to them. So I think that you'll see, Patty, that that has been taken into account as the person being the ultimate expert in what matters and how much it matters. So thank you for that question. But you know, there is another um, issue that, that local agencies are gonna have to struggle with and that uh, individual practitioners need to struggle with. I think in the mental health field, we have done such a good job of discouraging and demoralizing people um, that we have the perception um, that people um, are not motivated to move uh, away from what I often refer to as the overly warm embrace of the mental health system. Um, we've created a comfortable environment. And uh, the longer you are in the system, the more comfortable uh, that set of supports uh, and services, segregated though they are, may seem. And I think agencies have some work to do um, with, with consumers and consumer groups have some work to do uh, to work together with agencies to create a new vision of what's possible um, and, and not accept the, the, the uh, there's a sociologist named uh, Susan, Susan Estroff who many years ago, years ago talked about um, 
the, the subculture of psychiatric disability. Uh, that's part of what community inclusion is trying to take apart uh, and to help people in those areas where they want to participate more fully in everyday community life move away from that subculture and get the supports they need to do so. Okay, so the next question we have is from Linda. Where is community inclusion in the process of becoming an evidence-based practice? Uh, you want me to do it that way? I think we're a long way away. Um, I, I, I think we are struggling um, to help uh, managed care companies and community mental health centers and psychiatric rehabilitation programs and peer-operated programs and even peer specialist training programs uh, to look at this issue and to create more job descriptions, more explicit programs, more measures of success. Um, and I think over the next five or 10 years, we'll see a movement toward a, a greater adoption of these principles um, and, and really have the opportunity to do more intensive research to show its effectiveness so that it can be um, e exactly what you're saying, an evidence-based practice. Uh, I think our, the theory is good, and I think the potential is there. I think we have a way to go, and we're hoping to work with many of you in the field uh, to, to move in that direction. Okay, our next question. Gabby, I'd like to add something to that, if I may. Jared, can I just add, add on to Rick's comment there? Yeah. Um, with ahead. respect to evidence-based practices, I think of community inclusion as in what we hope will become an evidence-based principle if you will, um, along the lines of principles of recovery, principles of wellness. Rather than one practice, there would be many practices that would feed into the principle. So I, and, and then I want to uh, echo what Rick said about how we hope that you'll all help us get there. So thank you. Go ahead, Jared, please. Um, what is the thoughts of others using this toolkit, i.e. another MCO or providers, et cetera, and is the toolkit available to the public? Well, we hope that other um, uh, behavioral health MCOs are using the toolkit. We uh, and we thank our friends at the Association for Behavioral Health and Wellness who helped uh, uh, with a lot of input into the toolkit, and uh, it has been disseminated through their members. So we hope to hear more feedback, and that's something that we'll actively uh, solicit. The answer is: Is the toolkit available to the public? Thank you for that question. You bet it is. It can be downloaded right from the Temple Collaborative site, and I believe um, you have that information on the, on the page um, of, of how to get there at the tucollaborative.org. It's under resources, and the toolkit, uh, the monograph, and many other things are downloadable right from the Temple Collaborative's website. Yep. And the link is also available in the, uh, the top of the chat for people. It'll take you directly to the two documents that were discussed in today's presentation. Um, so our next question, will you go with us to our area's provider, such as the health systems of state Massachusetts, public health, and the DMH? <laughs> sure. Uh, I think we're anxious <laughs> to work with however we can with, with uh, uh, people in the field uh, to make the case for, uh, develop the policies surrounding, locate the funding involved um, uh, around any of these initiatives for community inclusion, to help train staff, um, to help design mission statements. Um, all of the issues that are uh, addressed in the toolkit are ones that uh, the folks at Mental Health America uh, and the folks here at Temple would be delighted to help out with. Okay. Um, would it be possible to get a list of ideas that other organizations are active being found to be successful? Um, as I say, within the toolkit, there there's many other resources that we didn't speak about today. And um, there's also, I believe, uh, some links uh, to the Temple Collaborative and contact information for me. I'm Debbie here at Mental Health America to send us what you think should be included. Um, because, as I said, this is an interactive tool. Also, in the last few moments, uh, there are some other resources on the website uh, that I'll point out. Uh, one uh, that the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania and the Clearinghouse 
developed for us about two years ago uh, was um, uh, a document, I think it's called In the Middle of Things. Um, it was a review of peer-operated programs that had done some innovative work around community inclusion. Uh, from the same group uh, on our website, we have a document that looks at innovative programs that uh, both peer and, and professional and religious groups have done together um, to help people connect to both the spiritual and social life of mainstream congregations. Um, those are two areas in which there are models that you can look at uh, for some of this work, and, and there are probably others uh, I'm not remembering right now. Um, I guess we can answer one more question before we go. Um, does the toolkit contain a fiscal instrument to com uh, compare net income from work with government uh, subsidies? <laughs> um, no. No, I'm afraid it doesn't. In fact, we'd love one. <laughs> so if you know of one. That's an interesting question. <laughs> but I do think mm -hmm. if, you, if you go to um, any of the uh, local programs or state programs um, that, uh, that look at the issue of work incentives uh, for people on SSI and SSDI, uh, there are probably tools there that help people compare uh, what happens to me if I go to work um, in, in terms of overall income. Um, and, and there are, in many states, uh, uh, agencies that have been established with a mixture of st state and federal funds that help individuals answer that question of, of how do, essentially, how do I use the work incentive provisions uh, under the SSA system uh, to make sure I don't lose track as, as I attempt this one particular area of integration, that is going back into competitive employment. But certainly call us. I think we can direct you to that. So this is actually all the time that we have for the uh, webinar. But um, I've recorded all the questions that were asked. And if possible, the panelists can respond to them by either email or a document that we put out. Um, if they do do that, they'll be put um, on, our web, um, on our website and announced to everyone who registered so that people will be able to access that document. Thank you. I hope I have time to thank everybody to, to um, say how um, grateful and uh, we are to have uh, the collaboration with Rick Barron at the Temple Collaborative, uh, the folks here at Mental Health America, and for our uh, input from uh, Leslie Schwalbe, how important it is to have uh, industry input and how gracious she and the folks at Optum have been. So we are, we are very appreciative. And thank you very much to the folks who took the time today to learn a little bit more about this. So um, please do use the Temple Collaborative website and send us emails and we'll be happy to answer questions. So thank you so much and thank you for your technical assistance, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.